next important aspect in uh, biodiversity is species diversity so this is the second level of diversity first level we have seen genetic diversity diversity at the genetic level second one is species diversity at the species level right so if you see this picture so there are different types of species see there uh, there is giraffe is there zebras are there other cattle are there so these are different types of species <music>
skin complexion here so that is because of the genetic diversity similarly some uh, some regions in some areas people will be shorter and uh, people in some other regions they will be taller so this is also because of uh, genetic diversity similarly uh, people in some areas like in regions of china and tibet so basically they tend to have smaller eyes so it is also because of genetic diversity so many uh, many whatever the differences we see so those are all those are uh, all those are because of the genetic diversity right importance of genetic diversity so genetic diversity allows populations to adapt to environmental changes so genetic genetic diversity allows the uh, a particular species to adapt to environmental changes so because of the changes in the environment uh, the uh, issues and aspects of the gene level change so that the particular species can be adapted to that particular uh, ecosystem we can say and respond to natural selection also so as you all know uh, there is a natural selection uh, process uh, we have uh, in lower classes we have understood that there is a natural selection process and also the principle of survival of the fittest so those who can survive the adversities of the environment those species have survived so to uh, respond to that process of natural selection so the species which are strong they have survived and other species have gone extinct so to respond to that natural natural process of selection is also genetic diversity is required right so the benefit of higher genetic diversity is higher higher genetic uh, variation enhances species ability to withstand environmental stress and disease outbreak so when there is a genetic uh, diversity that particular species can uh, adapt or it can withstand the uh, withstand the environmental stresses and it can also uh, respond well to the disease outbreaks i mean very when there is uh, diversity in the species those uh, species can uh, withstand well so yesterday when we were uh, sorry previously when we were studying the endangered species endangered species we have seen the example of asiatic lions so basically asiatic lions uh, they have con confined to the gir area in gujarat so gir national park and wildlife sanctuary they are confined to uh, the only that area they are surviving the number of asiatic lions is around 600 so because of the confinement to a particular area they are interbreeding continuously interbreeding only among themselves so because of this reason the genetic diversity is very less there in uh, asiatic lions so because of that reason when uh, a disease is attacks to so the asiatic lions are dying in many numbers because there is no genetic diversity so it, uh, lastly before 2 uh, 3 years before a particular disease has attacked uh, those lions so appro approximately around 200 lions have uh, died so this is the better example for genetic uh, sorry genetic diversity so when there is diversity at the gene level there is better chance of uh, the species surviving when a particular disease attack right next one is uh lower diversity may lead to genetic uniformity i mean all the species will look same and uh, which can be advantageous in crop production so when there is uniformity for example uh, rice if you take rice when a single uh, i mean there is less genetic diversity it is better for crop production but the problem is it limits the adaptability so if a pest if uh, a pest attacks the entire crop will be a get damaged similarly if uh, there is a drought so the entire crop will get destroyed so this is the problem with the uh, lower genetic diversity right so generally if we can see in practices especially after the green revolution etc we are adopting monocropping i mean monocropping means we are planting the single crop in all over the area so because of this the biodiversity is declining biodiversity is declining especially the genetic uh, biodiversity because we are choosing only a particular 
uh, I mean a a crop with particular characteristics, and we are growing it all over the place because of this reason. Other varieties they are uh, getting uh, disappeared, and because of that reason, biodiversity is getting reduced. If we see the examples examples of genetic variation. So each species contains a varying number of genes and the genetic information. Some of the examples are uh, the microplasma contains about 450 to 700 genes. Bacteria like Escherichia coli have 4,000 genes, and uh, fruit flies they have around what, 1,300 or uh, 15,000 genes. Uh, <coughs> similarly, the human when it comes to humans we have 35,000 to 45,000 genes. Right. So, genetic, genetic variation can occur in terms of gene structure and the numbers allowing populations to adapt and evolve. So, because of the gene diversity only, the human beings have able to survive throughout the ages and they are thriving, we can say. So, all this because of the uh, diversity, genetic diversity only. Right. So, if we see the sources of genetic variation, Genetic variations are uh, variation arises from gene and chromosomal mutations. So, in sexually reproducing organisms such as uh, the we can say all uh, vertebrates, they sexually produce uh, offspring. Especially, they, if we see the uh, humans also. So, in uh, those types of organisms, recombination during the reproduction introduces introduces new genetic combinations. Right. So as you all know, when uh, sexually uh, sexual reproduction happens, the genes both from mother and the father will come, and when they combine, they produce new genetic combinations. So because of this, also genetic diversity improves. Right. Next is role of natural selection. This also plays an important role in genetic diversity. Right. <laughs> Through natural selection. Advantageous traits become more prevalent in a population over time, contributing to adaptation and evolution. So the principle of natural selection, it selects the strong and uh, strong species and uh, uh, the weak species, the uh, weak, uh, we can say populations or species, they go, uh, they extinct. So through this process also, the advantageous traits in a particular species so, for example, advantage, uh, advantage, advantageous trait means. So, for example, a particular species is there in the polar regions. So, the species with fur, full fur, it tends to survive more. So, those species with more fur, they will be advantageous. This trait becomes advantageous, and that uh, character becomes more prevalent, uh, leading to uh, the adaptation and evolution of that particular. Species. Right. So, this is the role of natural selection. If we see the India's genetic, genetic diversity, so apart from the uh, general concept, you try to remember specific aspects about India also in all the when we are studying the all the aspects of biodiversity. So, if we see India's genetic biodiversity, so basically India is recognized as the center of high crop genetic diversity identified as a Vavilov's, Vavilov's center after the Russian agrobotanist N.I. Vavilov. So basically India has recognized as the high, high, which has the high crop genetic diversity, right. So this particular scientist Vavilov, he identified India as one of the eight centers of origin of cultivated plants worldwide in 1950s, right. India's rich genetic biodiversity contributes to its agricultural heritage and biodiversity conservation effort. So, this is some information about India's genetic biodiversity. Next important aspect in uh, biodiversity is species diversity. So, this is the second level of diversity. First level we have seen genetic diversity, diversity at the genetic level. Second one is species diversity at the species level right so if you see this picture so there are different types of species see there, uh, there is giraffe is there zebras are there other cattle are there 
so these are different types of species so the all these species are uh, we can say there are diverse species are there so this uh, uh, gives us this species diversity similarly we can say birds also so this is also a different species again we can take the plants also this is a different plant this is a different plant and uh, small plants are also there so there are these are uh, plant species so there are uh, species different kinds of species in fauna and also different kinds of species in flora so all this comprise the species diversity right so if we see the definition species diversity refers to variety of species within a specific geographical area right variety of species within a specific geographical area so here this is a particular geographical area the ecosystem uh, we can say it is the grassland in africa grassland in africa by the look of it we can say so this particular region uh, having different types of species so it is called the variety of species within a ge specific geographical area it is called as species diversity so <coughs> species diversity is quantified and understood through several measurements so there are some measurements to them we will understand better understand understand the species diversity first of one is first of uh, the, these indicators is species richness so species richness uh, richness denotes that the total number of different species present within a defined area so the total number of differ, different species present in a particular area thus that gives us the species richness so variety of species are living in a particular area it is uh, that is known as speech species richness next one is species abundance so right so species abundance is within a species so there are many uh, many population i mean in a particular species there are many number of uh, we can say the <coughs> uh, population is much right so species abundance refers to the relative number of individuals among different species within a area so different species are there so the number of i mean individuals of those species also very large if you take for example urban area urban area humans are there so this is a species but the number of human beings also very much a lot of human beings are living in a one particular area that gives us the species abundance so when we take a uh, we can say wetland wetland so many organisms live here we can say birds live here right fish live here so within the birds <coughs> there are the number of birds is very high high number of birds similarly if you take fish so there are many number of fish are there so the number is very high so in this case it is known as species abundance so not only species richness is there the, the individuals number of individuals within that species is also very high then it is known as species abundance next one is taxonomic or phylo uh, phylogenetic diversity so ta taxonomic or phy phylogenetic diversity focuses on genetic relation uh, genetic relationships between different groups of species so then there are when there are genetic relationships between different groups of species it is known as taxonomic or phylogenetic diversity right right it is it considers the evolutionary history and the relatedness of species within an ecosystem so species will be interdependent on each other this thing we know so this particular characteristic shows that uh, dependence uh, dependency so the one specific uh, significance of this relation is areas with the taxonomically unrelated species so when there is, there is a when the dependence between the species is less so they exhibit the greater species diversity than those dominated by 
taxonomy taxonomically related species so when there is uh, less uh, dependency upon each other so the species diversity is more there right if you see uh, the global level if you see the species diversity at the global level so global diversity of species is immense with approximately 1.7 million species described to date so till now 1.7 million species have been identified and their characteristics have been described and estimates suggesting that total number could be range from 5 to 15 million so 1.7 million are just identified there are many other species which do not have identified till now so they need to be identified and described so all over if you see there could be 5 to 50 million species on the earth right so species diversity is not evenly distributed worldwide so try to remember the, uh, these characteristics uh, these are important so species diversity is not uniform all across the world the equatorial regions they show the higher richness so at the equators or the regions close to the equator they have the higher species diversity right <coughs> so the biodiversity tends to decrease uh, from equ equatorial to polar regions and it decreases with increasing altitude in terrestrial ecosystems so one of the other important characteristics one thing is the species diversity is more concentrated at the equator and its uh, uh, adjacent regions so one go uh, one goes from equatorial region to polar region towards polar region the diversity getting gets reduced right <coughs> so biodiversity tends to decrease from equatorial to polar region so the biodiversity is uh, high 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 at uh, equatorial regions and the one once we go from equatorial regions to polar region the biodiversity gets decreased similarly if we take the terrestrial ecosystems so when when we start moving from surface to uh, we can say into the atmosphere the biodiversity gets reduced so the biodiversity is the highest at the surface level when it comes to terrestrial ecosystems right these are some of the important characteristics please try to remember that right so some of the factors are important uh, when it comes to the influencing the biodiversity so factors such as rainfall patterns soil nutrient levels and the environmental conditions influence species diversity so remember these factors also when it comes to marine ecosystems species richness is notably high in continental shelves right <coughs> So when it comes to marine ecosystem, species richness, more species are there. Uh, notably, uh, the more species are there in continental shelves, right? When we see, if we see the India's biodiversity, when it comes to species, so India is renowned for its vast biodiversity, ranking among the 12 mega biodiversity countries globally. So there are. uh mega by uh, 12 mega biodiversity hot uh, diversity uh, regions are there mega biodiversity regions are there so india ranks one among them so india is one of the these two, 12 mega biodiversity hot spots right so countries diverse ecosystem support wide variety of plants animals and microbial species so this uh, biodiversity is influenced by varied geography climate ecological conditions contributing to the status as a biodiversity hotspot so remember this point india he is one of the 12 mega biodiversity hotspot so india is one of the india is a mega biodiversity hotspot right So third third important component in biodiversity is ecosystem diversity we have seen diversity at the gene level we have seen diversity at the species level now we are seeing diversity at the ecosystem level right now in the image here in the image you can see different types of ecosystems 
So this is marine marine ecosystem, basically ocean and the polar ecosystem, where area where the regions where. Right. The next one is polar polar ecosystem, where the regions where the surface of the earth is covered by uh, ice. Next one is mountains, uh, mountain ecosystem, where the geography is characterized by mountains. Forest, forest ecosystem, where uh, the ecosystem is dominated by plant, various plant varieties. Next is the desert ecosystem. Next is grassland ecosystem. We can say these are different types of ecosystem. So diversity is there at this ecosystem levels also. So marine uh, is different from polar. Similarly, polar is different from mountains, etc. Right. Right. Ecosystem diversity, uh, diversity refers to variety of different types of ecosystems present within a region. So, if you take India also, India has different types of ecosystems. India has deserts, India has coastal areas, India has plains, India has uh, Himalayan mountain region. And it also has the deciduous forest. And when it comes to Northeast India and Andaman and Nicobar, it has uh, in areas, it has evergreen forest. So these are different types of ecosystems, right? So definition, if you see ecosystem diversity is exemplified by presence of various ecosystem types, such as tropical, uh, tropical rainforest, deserts, marine ecosystems and the freshwater ecosystem right each ecosystem our type is different significantly in its structure composition and species diversity right if we see the characteristics of ecosystem so when it comes to india ecosystem di diversity encompasses broad range of difference observed in ecosystem so if we take the case of uh, in India, so it has different, remarkable, different terrestrial and ecosystems, diversity spanning from snow covered Himalayas to, uh, to arid deserts, lush tropical rainforests, and the coastal mangroves. So, when it comes to India, it has these many types of ecosystems. Right. Now, we will understand the characteristic or the property, or we can say feature of endemism. Right. So India's ecosystems are characterized by high levels of endemism. So endemism, previously also I explained. We will now understand what is endemism. <coughs> Brief uh, after a few minutes, we will understand endemism. So with many species found exclu exclusively within specific regions. So what is exactly meant by endemism? So when species, particular species. These are only found in a particular area. Only found in a particular area. It is known as endemism. Right. When a particular species is there, it can only found in that area. For example, a particular banana plantation is there. Some variety of banana plant is there. So such banana plant is found only in Andaman and Nicobar Islands and it will not be found anywhere else. So that type of species is known as endemic species. So it is endemic to Andaman and Nicobar. So uh, similarly, some uh, one type of frog is there. Some type of frog is there. So it is only found in Western Ghats, and it is not found anywhere else. So that species is endemic to Western Ghats. Right. So when a particular species or a group of species, they are confined only only to a specific area. So those species are called endemic to that region and uh, those species are called as endemic species, right? So when it comes to India, two regions are very, very important when it comes to the property of endemism. Endemism, the, those are Western Ghats and Northeastern region of India or we can say the Eastern Himalayas. So these are, uh, uh, we can say endemic, uh, endem uh, endemic regions and uh, these regions are home to many endemic plant and animal species, right? So they are particularly rich in biodiversity, harboring numerous endemic species. So many species are there 
in these regions they are only find can find only in those areas they cannot be found in anywhere else so in this way they harbor a lot of biodiversity by uh, habiting or hosting many endemic species right so endemic species they are concentrated in areas such as western ghats the northwestern himalayas northwestern himalayas also hosting some endemic plants and uh, andaman and andaman and nicobar islands so when it comes to uh, himalayas the eastern himalayas they have the more endemic species when we take uh, india when we take india over uh, to western ghats the uh, western himalayas and the eastern himalayas and the northeastern region and also the andaman and the nicobar islands so these four regions these four regions they are hosting many endemic species right so approximately 33% of flowering plants species in india are endemic i mean 33% of the flowering plants which are there so in all the flowering plants that are there in india 30 33% them are endemic which means so these 33% of the plants they cannot be found outside india right so this much biodiversity india is hosting right similarly similar to plants india also hosts of uh, many endemic species uh, when it comes to animals also so both in uh, fauna and flora india has rich biodiversity and it is one of the 12 mega biodiversity hotspots right now we will understand about the hotspots of biodiversity right we have understood the property of endemism right try to remember this one endemism characteristics of endemism i hope you have understood it and uh, india also has uh, four important endemic uh, we can say the biodiversity hotspots where the endemic species are uh, concentrated a lot so those regions are western ghats uh, eastern himalaya and western himalaya and uh, andaman and uh, nicobar islands so when it comes to much richness in species the western ghats and the eastern himalaya are very much important right so endemism this is endemism now we will understand about one more important uh, concept it is hot spots of bio diversity right so biodiversity is not evenly distributed across the globe we have seen it so at the equator the biodiversity is more so when we go towards the travel towards the polar regions the biodiversity gets uh, decreasing right so certain regions uh, within the i mean on the globe certain regions are characterized by exceptionally high levels of species richness so some areas are there uh, for example western ghats so these kinds of regions they have exceptionally high level of species richness so more and more number of species are concentrated in particular areas right so these uh, regions are called as mega diversity zones or biodiversity hotspots or hotspots of biodiversity right we can say <coughs> these regions are also uh, characterized by endemism um, endemism so more and more and more endemic species are also concentrated here so where there is lot of species richness and endemism is there those regions are called hotspots of biodiversity so when it comes to india both the western ghats and the northeastern india or the eastern himalaya they are the hotspots of biodiversity right so hotspots are they are geographical areas that exhibit high levels of biodiversity also they are under significant threat so the threats we have understood there are threats to biodiversity especially the climate change and the release of pollutants etc and also when we were studying the vulnerable species we have understood in particular specific important region destruction of habitat destruction of habitat so because of all these reasons majorly because of the interference of human being and the activities of the human beings the threat is more 
so basically where the species richness is there in the threats to those biodiversity are present those regions are called biodiversity hotspots right so basically it is the concept uh, is uh, introduced by norman myers he is a british ecologist this concept is introduced in 1988 right right there is a criteria for identify identifying these uh, we can say regions biodiversity hotspots so including some of the criteria are presence of large number of endemic species and significant habitat loss so <clears throat> so there are variety of species are there and they are those species are endemic species and also there is a threat threat for the existing biodiversity there so these are the important two important criteria for demarcating a region as as biodiversity hotspot right now we will see the criteria exact criteria for classification a region to be classified as a biodiversity hotspot so to be classified as a hotspot hotspot uh area must support more than 1500 endemic species so one criteria is this one so that particular region will be hosting 1500 more than 1500 endemic species endemic species means those species are only found in that particular region they cannot be found anywhere else right and the second criteria is they they could have uh, they uh, must have experienced 70% habitat loss so these are the this is the second criteria so if a particular region uh, fulfills these two conditions it will be classified as hotspot of biodiversity right so when it comes to world there are 25 recognized biodiversity hotspots are there so all over the globe 25 regions have demarcated as biodiversity hotspots right so don't confuse with uh, this number 25 there are Uh, 12 biodiverse mega biodiversity regions are there this is different so based on the uh, species endemism and uh, the threats to habitat loss all over the world 25 regions have been recognized as biodiversity hotspots covering so these the 25% regions covering only 1.4% of the earth's land surface but they are supporting 44% uh, 44 of the plants and 35% of the terrestrial vertebrate species right so because of this reason only they become very very significant so try to remember these facts there are 25 biodiversity hotspots are there they are covering just 1.4% of the total land area but supporting 44% of the plant species and 35% of the terrestrial vertebrate species right now we will see the 25 biodiversity hotspots so these are the 25 biodiversity hotspots some of the examples are western african forest uh, brazil's uh, brazil is there uh, brazil's atlantic forest is there so these are the uh, some of the biodiversity hotspot when it comes to the entire world so in this 25 two regions are there from india also so those are this is Uh, western ghats in sri lanka this is one and the second one is indo burma region so in this region the eastern himalayas region come in this particular biodiversity hotspot so in western ghats and uh, western ghats in sri lanka the western ghats part it will come so from among the 25 biodiversity hotspots of the world uh, two are there from india right right some other uh, we can say biodiversity hotspots you can see Sundaland is there, Madagascar is there, so Philippines is there, South Central China, uh, China is there, Polynesia and Micronesia is there, right? So New Zealand is there, Southwestern Australia is there, right? So these are all these are the 25 mega uh, biodiversity hotspots in the world, right? Now we will try to understand the biodiversity hotspots of India, right? So the to india is home to two biodiversity hotspots one is western western uh, western ghats and the next one is eastern himalayas on the northeastern region right 
Western Ghats, uh, you all you know very well. It is uh, extend, extending from uh, Gujarat, which starts from Gujarat, majorly covers states of Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala. So it is basically western coast of Indian Peninsula. <coughs> it runs parallel to the western coast of <coughs> Indian Peninsula. So both it has variety of forest range. Uh, the forest range, if you see, it ranges from low elevation evergreen forest to semi evergreen forest at the higher altitudes. Right. When we see the eastern Himalaya, it extends to northeastern Asia, northeastern India, and Bhutan, characterized by temperate forests found at altitudes of 1780 to 3500 meters. Right. So this region harbors, Himalayan region harbors deep valleys, rich endemic plant species. Right. If you understand the species richness and endemism of these two regions, so both Western Ghats and Eastern Himalayas are exceptionally rich in biodiversity, hosting diverse flora and fauna. Right. So these regions known for their abundance of flowering plants, reptiles, amphibians, butterflies, etc., and uh, some other normal species also. Right. So these are some of the. This is some of the important uh, information about the biodiversity hotspots in India. So try to remember this name. So when it comes to biodiversity hotspots, two are very very important: Western Ghats and Eastern Himalaya. Similarly, other two important regions are there. That is Western Himalaya and Andaman and Nicobar also. Right. So though these are not biodiversity hotspots, the biodiversity and endemism species endemism is also here also it is more prevalent right so all this is uh, till now we have seen about the biodiversity concept of biodiversity and endemism and biodiversity hotspots now we will understand the services of biodiversity how biodiversity is helping uh, the ecosystem and especially the human beings right so what happens when this uh, and we will also see what happens once this biodiversity gets disappeared or it gets affected right so the value of biodiversity uh, it uh, provides a wide array of benefits to both ecosystems and human societies so these category these can be these services can be categorized into some groups ecosystem services biological resources and social benefit first we will see ecosystem services protection of water resources so this you can uh, understand so when there are rich variety of plants and uh, etc so they uh, they filter the dirty water and only uh, uh, the pure water will seep into ground and will get the drinking water from there so it uh, helps in protection of water resources so the natural vegetation cover helps regulate the hydrological cycles, cycles, stabilize water runoff, and mitigate extreme events like floods and drought. So in this way, it helps in protecting the water resources. Similarly, wetlands and forests act as water purifying systems, while mangroves reduce impacts or impact on marine ecosystem by trapping it. Next, soil protection. So biological diversity aids in soil conservation, moisture retention, and the nutrient recycling uh, and uh, retention. Right. Next service is uh, nutrient storage and recycling. So biodiversity also helps in cycling of nutrients and uh, the storage of nutrients. Right. Next is pollution reduction. So biodiversity. Uh, the ecosystems play a cru crucial role in uh, maintaining air quality, breaking down waste, and removing pollutants. So, when we were studying the topic of pollution, we have seen all these aspects, right? So similarly, wetlands, particularly, they filter effluents, reduce uh, biological oxygen demand, devoting, and destroy harmful microorganisms. Similarly, climate stability, so biodiversity, it helps. Uh, stabilize the climate due, uh, which is affected by various uh, we can say aspects similarly maintenance of ecological process 
So biodiversity contributes to pest control by predators and birds, reducing the need for artificial control measures. Right. So uh, the importance of ecological services or ecosystem services. So these are essential for human well-being, including food security, clean air, and and waste management also. Right. The other category of uh, services. Biological resources, uh, biological resources provided by the biodiversity are so food, medicines, fuel wood, fiber, ornamental plants are also there. So all these are the biological resources. Uh, and uh, one other subcategory here is breeding material for uh, crop improvement. So wild relatives of cultivated crop plants are burned valuable genes that can be utilized for crop improvement programs. So in this way also biodiversity helps us. Right. Similarly, future resources it provides the conservation of biological diversity is linked to discovery of new biological resources. Right. Now the third category of benefits, those are social benefits of biodiversity. So biodiversity regions are, they are home for recreation, <coughs> forests, wildlife, national parks, sanctuaries, gardens, etc. They all, these are sources of recreation. Similarly, biodiversity also has cultural values. So they play an integral role in human society. Right. Next is, uh, source, uh, biodiversity is also source for research, education and monitoring. So this is the fourth kind of service provided by biodiversity, right? So it provides invaluable opportunities for research, education and monitoring efforts. So through these aspects, all these aspects, we can better understand the biodiversity and the ecosystems so that we can better adapt to the uh, ecosystems and we can better survive, right? So these are the services of biodiversity, right? So this could be a topic. It is more re uh, more relevant for the mains examination. In mains, there could be a question about the services that are provided by biodiversity or ecosystem. So basically, for both the points will be similar. Try to remember these points. In the prelims examination, also uh, the there can be some points. Uh, some there can be points. There can be a question about the services provided by the uh, biodiversity or the benefits of biodiversity so the examiner can uh, give a list of services and uh, he might ask which of the below which of the above services are provided uh, which of the benefits are arising from the biodiversity right so to answer those kind of questions you should be thorough with these aspects right now we will understand the uniqueness of indian biodiversity right we have seen India is hosting two of the 25 uh, biodiversity hotspots <coughs> and also it is one of the 12 mega biodiversity regions mega diversity mega biodiversity regions right so now we will understand the uniqueness of India's biodiversity right right country is uh, location to we have understood different uh, types of uh, ecosystems like tropical uh, location and uh, physical features climate types so it has different climate types they contribute to its unparalleled richness in biodiversity right wide, wide variety of ecosystems are there so despite india occupying only 2.2.4 percent uh, of the global land area it harbors 7 to 8 percent of Walls recorded species. So, see the uh, ratio only it is uh, occupying 2.4 percent of the land region, but it is home to 7 to 8 percent of the world's recorded species. So, country supports uh, over 45,000 species of plants and uh, 81,000 species of animals, showcasing its remarkable biodiversity. So if we understand the different uh, regions that are supporting biodiversity, so the trans Himalayan region, so the region that is running parallel to the Himalayas above parallel. So if these are Himalayas, so this is the trans Himalayan region. 
so it hosts the richest wild sheep and goat community globally along with iconic species like snow leopard black necked crane the, if we see the desert ecosystems so the great indian bus, uh, bustard an endangered species so we have studied that indian bustard great indian bustard is a critically endangered species so it's uh, it is found in regions like gujarat known for extensive grasslands so it is basically found in the grasslands of gujarat so similarly in northeastern india it stands out stands out as one of the country's biodiversity hotspots it is renowned for its rich diversity of orchids bamboo ferns citrus fruits banana mango and jute so these are all the uh, floral uh, fauna variety that is found in the northeastern regions similarly india's coast coastal regions if you see they are rich in coral reefs with major formations occurring in gulf of mannar park bay gulf of kutch and andaman and nicobar islands and even in lakshadweep so in these areas the coral reefs can be found in india right so these are the regional varieties of biodiversity in india right now we will understand the threats to biodiversity so despite richness so indian biodiversity faces threats from various anthropogenic activities so the major threat to biodiversity is coming from the humans themselves right so we can classify the threats into basically into three categories direct causes so direct causes are like deforestation hunting poaching commercial uh, exploitation so these are the direct threats some indirect causes are there so loss or modification of natural habitat because of the human intervention intervention the natural habitation is changing similarly another factor is introduction of exotic species i mean foreign species right next is pollution so these are the indirect causes natural causes are also there so basically climate change and uh, general environmental changes that uh, that come are also the one of the cause for uh, we can say loss of biodiversity or threat to biodiversity right however the uh, causes direct and indirect caused by the humans this is the main reason and uh, because of the uh, we can say actions of the human beings also all only the biodiversity is getting affected all right so if we understand the major causes of biodiversity or threats to biodiversity <coughs> the they are habitat destruction previously also we have studied the major threats are habitat destruction over exploitation they are the primary drivers of biodiversity loss right so the causes are first cause is habitat destruction so activities like deforestation urbanization infrastructure development they are alter or destroy the natural landscape and habitats displacing and endangering numerous species so various developmental activities we are taking so because of this reason the natural habitat of the wildlife that is being destroyed so because of that they are facing threats of extinction similarly fragmentation of forest tracks so we are laying uh, railway tracks we are building roads and we are uh, uh, taking power lines so and we are digging canals through the forest so if this is the forest area we are uh, building infrastructure uh, within this uh, <coughs> forest area so because of this the animals which are here they cannot move here also they cannot move here so because of this region their habitat is being fragmented so this this also acting as a major threat to the survival of the biodiversity right another factor is introduction of ex exotic uh, species exotic species these are not native to a particular region so non native species introduced through human activities they can have negative uh, they can outcompete the na native species i mean they can destroy the native species leading to their decline and extinction so some of the examples of this exotic species or uh, we can say these are also uh, these are also known as the these are also known as the alien species alien species 
right so when these are introduced they will destroy the existing uh, we can say the species there and they will they start thriving right some of the examples are parthenium so it is a grass so when it entered uh, when it entered india it uh, started destroying the all other grass uh, we can say grass varieties there and it started thriving similarly nile perch uh, so it uh, it is a we can say animals like nile perch when they enter they destroy the other existing uh, we can say animals in a particular region so right right next is pollution efficient air and water pollution including acid rain toxic substances degrade habitats and directly harm species right similarly plastic pollution also poses a significant threat to marine life So, so plastic uh, you you can understand so it is it poses a lot of threat to biodiversity next is population growth and uh, poverty so po- when population bulges or grows so the i mean we have we need more food more space to build houses and etc our needs also will increase and it uh, directly or indirectly uh, impact the ecosystems and uh, the other species getting reduced right so when population increases it leads to over exploitation and loss of biodiversity next one is poverty exacerbates or increases the issue of uh, exploitation of resources as communities rely heavily on natural resources for their subsistence so when uh, uh, we may amaze that how poverty uh, contributes to the biodiversity decline so when people are not in a posi- position to uh, utilize the resources effectively they tend to use uh, more and more resources uh, so in this way the biodiversity gets declined similarly we have a phrase poverty is the biggest polluter poverty is the is the biggest polluter so when people are poor they tend to depend more on natural resources So when natural resources are utilized more and more so pollution is uh, getting created and uh, when poverty is there we fail to res- use the resources efficiently so because of this reason also there will be wastage and uh, wastage there will be wastage and there will be over exploitation all right so to achieve sustainable development it is always it, it is being said that we have to eliminate poverty right so try to understand this vicious circle so in the mains examination you can <coughs> use this cycle one side poverty it leads to over exploitation or we can say under development or unsustainable development and in other in uh, it also under development also leads to poverty so you can use this uh, under development and ineffective use of resources in effective use of use of resources so subsequently it leads to again poverty so because of poverty we will not be able to use uh, resources effectively right so this is the vicious circle uh, right now we will understand the need for uh, conserving biodiversity we have understood the threats to biodiversity now we will understand why biodiversity needs to be conserved right so <clears throat> conservation of biodiversity is crucial why to prevent loss of genetic diversity so genetic diversity when it is protected it enhances resilience and survival rates enabling species to thrive in diverse habitats and resist threats such as disease and climate change so to uh, because of this reason we need to protect the biodiversity next reason is preventing extinction so when biodiversity is not protected uh, finally the human beings they have to uh, extinct so to for our survival also the bio- biodiversity becomes very very important further human is human beings are uh, no we can say situated at the top level or we can say at the third trophic level 
uh, when it comes to when we were studying the studying the food chains and the food webs we have understood so at the beginning will be producers next year primary consumers next there will be tertiary consumers so generally human way human being will come at the secondary or third trophic level so at the as the trophic level increases the threat of existence becomes much more because here the dependency will be more i mean there will be many sources at the lower trophic levels for survival so as the trophic level increases the threat also becomes much much longer we can better understand with the example of tiger so because tiger is located at the apex level of the uh, we can say in a uh, in a food chain so it is i mean their numbers are dwindling fast and they have hunted and their numbers are confined to only thousands now so similarly the particular case uh, we can say applies to human beings also oh, so for the preventing extinction of uh, various other species including human beings we have to protect the biodiversity right so conservation initiatives work to prevent species from becoming extinct thereby maintaining integrity of ecosystems and preserving their ecological functions so by protecting endangered species conservation efforts contribute to overall biodiversity conservation and ecosystem stability next is uh, next reason why we need to conserve uh, biodiversity is protecting ecosystems from damage and destruction right so by preserving uh, intact ecosystems and restoring the degraded ones conservation efforts promote ecosystem health and resilience supporting services by uh, provided by uh, provided to human being so when ecosystems are preserved preserved the services that are provided by the biodiversity or ecosystem they continue continue to be supplied to human being right so because of these all these reasons the biodiversity has to be conserved right now we will understand the strategies of our conservation of our strategies of conservation so basically the strategies can be divided broadly into two categories in situ conservation and ex situ conservation right so in situ conservation is conserving the biodiversity where it is placed right within the region within that region or the species or biodiversity wherever it is existing when conservation measures are taken at that place only it is known as in situ in situ conservation so it involves protecting plants and animals within their natural habitats or in designated protected areas so when conservation takes in these places it is in situ conservation ex situ conservation is so conserving animals and plants outside their natural habitat so utilizing facilities such as botanical gardens zoos gene banks seed banks tissue culture and the crypto conservation so all these are known as ex situ conservation so try to remember this difference in prelims previously there have been, there has been a question like all the conservation measures have been given like wildlife sanctuary national park next uh, zoo geological zoo, zoo parks next is uh, botanical gardens so there will be a question like this which of the above are the in situ conservation measures so you you are in a position to you should be in a position to uh, we can say know the differentiation between the in, in situ measures and uh, ex situ conservation measures right we will see uh, in some detail about the in situ and ex situ conservation measures right in situ conservation measures so in that one important as one important measure is protection of the habitat itself so when the habitat is protected the i mean species that are residing there they will also get protected so this is one category in in situ uh, conservation right so this strategy involves conservation involves uh, preserving habitats within respective ecosystem right so some of the examples are so india declared many protected areas including national parks wildlife sanctuaries and biosphere reserves so we have studied each of this uh, national parks wildlife sanctuaries and biosphere reserves 
the important national parks also we have seen wildlife sanctuaries also we have seen and uh, the key species associated with this national park or wildlife sanctuary also we have studied similarly we have also studied the bio uh, sphere reserve india is home to 18 bio diversity no, sorry the uh, biosphere reserves so among those 18 12 are recognized internationally and they are directly under the protection of the unesco right here uh, for your benefit i have listed some of the important uh, national parks wildlife sanctuaries and uh, biodiversity uh, we can say uh, biosphere reserves please go through this list right next is wildlife conservation efforts so there are some uh, we can say non governmental organizations or civil society organizations also working for the uh, conservation of biodiversity we have seen examples like bombay natural history society is there world wide world wildlife fund of india chapter we have seen <coughs> similarly wildlife trust of india is there so many organizations are there both governmental and non non governmental so they are also working for the protection of biodiversity and wildlife conservation so those are also those efforts are also there right so we when we understand we will have we have to understand the concept of biosphere reserves because their structure is different so basically the biosphere reserves we have understood that uh, they are well placed well placed to uh, conserve biodiversity with the we can say collaboration with the local people basically biodiversity uh, so we can say the biosphere reserves are a concept where the wildlife and the humans humans live in harmony so the harmonious wildlife biosphere uh, reserves work for the harmonious or they work for promotion of the harmonious coexistence of human beings and wildlife harmonious so basically the concept uh, concept of biosphere reserves it classifies the biosphere reserves into three zones basically this uh, three zones are classified as core zone so first one the core area will be de uh, declared as core zone next surrounding the core zone buffer zone will be there merely out of this after the buffer zone uh, another zone will be there this transition zone so in this transition zone human beings are also uh, they can enter and they can have their settlements here so basically the concept uh, allows for a harmonious coexistence of human being and wildlife so basically it is divided into three zones core zone uh, <coughs> buffer zone and transition zone right try to find out more about these uh, three zones in the biosphere reserves right so functions of biosphere reserves are conservation it tries for conserving the biodiversity development so promotion of culturally socially and ecologically sustainable economic development encouraging traditional resource use also it promotes for what for scientific research monitoring and education so these are the functions of the bio sphere reserves right so third aspect or third sub category in in situ conservation is uh, we can say species oriented conservation projects so we have seen uh, first one is uh, protection of the habitat itself second uh, category is wildlife conservation effects by various governmental and non governmental organization third one is species oriented conservation projects some projects are there which are speci specific specifically dedicated at uh, towards the species itself so best example first and best example is project tiger so it is initiated in 1973 to conserve and rescue the tiger species from extinction so once abundant in indian forest tiger populations declined drastically due to hunting and also due to habitat uh, destruction so their uh, estimates once they were existing in 40 for like uh, 40000 numbers so by 1970s they dwindled to only 1200 
So in the beginning of the 20th century, there were around 40,000 tigers in India. So by 1970s, they reached the number of uh, 1,200. So because of that reason, Project Tiger has been started. And uh, after that, many, um, we can say national parks have been declared to protect the tiger. Right. So the tiger census will be held uh, for every four years. Try to uh, know about it. So at present, they are tigers. Uh, Variedly, the latest tiger census estimate tiger populations uh, to be around 3,000 to 4,000. <coughs> so there is a lot of improvement after the initiation of Project Tiger. Right. So try to more, know more about the latest uh, census, uh, latest census. So the latest figures available are 2023, and the Tiger census will be held for every four years. Right. So similarly, another project is Project Elephant. So it is launched in February 1992 to ensure long-term survival of wild elephant populations in their natural habitations. Right. So Project Tiger, Project Elephant uh, are there. So basically, it implemented in 12 states. Project uh, Elephant with free-ranging elephant populations. Right. So it basically aimed at protecting identified viable elephant populations through habitat conservation, anti-poaching measures, and the mitigation of human elephant conflicts. Right. Similarly, third program, uh, which is species-specific uh, program, so the crocodile breeding and the management project. So it is initiated in 1976 uh, with assistance from FAO, UNDP, to save endangered crocodilian species. So species targeted are freshwater crocodiles, saltwater crocodile and the rare gharial species <coughs> crocodiles, right. So basically, sanctuaries have been created for conservation and uh, breeding of the crocodiles. The best example is the National Sam uh, Chambal Sanctuary in Madhya Pradesh. So this is one of the famous sanctuaries uh, which is focusing on crocodile production, uh, protection and breeding. So these are some of the species oriented projects. Right. Next is uh, the concept of sacred forests and uh, sacred river, uh, sector, uh, sacred lakes. So this is also one of the in-situ conservation methods. So basically this is uh, seen mostly in states like Karnataka, uh, Maharashtra, Kerala and Meghalaya. So basically in these states, the concept of sacred groves. Sacred groves or sacred forests. is seen the sacred uh, forest so they are a small patches of forest protected by tribal communities based on religious uh, beliefs so purpose is to uh, they are considered sacred leading to their protection from human disturbances right similarly sacred lakes concept is also there so it is similar to sacred forest sacred lakes are water bodies declared sacred by local communities so uh, Examples are uh, Keshio Palri Lake in Sikkim is one such example. Sacred Lake, it is protected by local beliefs resulting in the preservation and uh, and its aquatic uh, biodiversity. Right. So this is, this is the concept of sacred lakes and the sacred uh, groves or sacred forests. So this is also one of the examples of in-situ conservation measures. Right. Now we will see the uh, ex situ conservation methods. So, first in these uh, methods is botanical gardens and uh, juice. Uh, this purpose of these uh, things is to they facilitate the uh, complement in situ. Uh, they are they complement the uh, ek, uh, in situ conservation measures. So, they work as a complement to the in situ conservation uh, in situ conservation measures. So, so they uh, can I mean they. They contribute by conserving plant and animal species outside their natural habitations. Right. So some of the examples are given here. Indian Botanical Garden in Howrah. So so many botanical gardens are there. Juice are there. You can see. So through uh, through these botanical gardens and juice, so species, animal species, and uh, plant species are conserved there. Right. Next we can see the gene banks. So 
they preserve the genetic resources of plants and animals for future use next is crypto preservation so it involves storing biological material at ultra low temperatures typically in liquid nitrogen to suspend metabolic activities so this is also one of the conservation measures right so conservation next is conservation at the molecular or dna level so it focuses on preserving genetic material including cloned dna and native dna right so these are the some of the examples of uh, the uh, we can say ex situ conservation measures right now we will see some legal measures legal measures of biodiversity conservation so all the legal measures we have covered them in the previous topics when we were uh, discussing the uh, acts related to the uh, we can say environment related acts we have covered so just here i am giving a brief introduction about them so that you can better connect the topics right so legal measures wildlife protection act has been enacted in uh, 1972 we have studied this one so <coughs> so this acts i mean it contributes Uh, and it makes some regulations rules and regulations for protection and conservation of biodiversity right so relate uh, this act uh, with the previously we have studied environment related acts there we have studied about this act in detail so try to recover the information right next uh, next uh, legal measure is convention on international trade in endangered species of wild fauna and flora sites convention is there so it is an international agreement aimed at regulating international trade and uh, in endangered species and their derivatives next is convention on biological diversity is there we have seen so it is the outcome of the art summit 1992 we have also studied about it to try to recollect the information next biological diversity act also we have studied when we were studying the important acts and we have Uh, studied the its uh, I mean um, we can, we have studied its salient features also yeah, protection of community rights benefit sharing access into benefit sharing and the funding for protection of biodiversity also we have seen right similarly support from conservation organizations so many organizations and uh, civil society organizations are there they are also contributing to the protection of biodiversity right. so these are the aspects about biodiversity the concept of biodiversity the aspects the, i mean the types of biodiversity and uh, biodiversity hotspots also we have seen the endemism of uh, species we have seen and the uh, services of biodiversity we have seen and also the threats uh, that are fa- that are being faced from bio, uh, by biodiversity threats to bi- biodiversity we have understood similarly we have seen the need for conserving the biodiversity and also we have seen the conservation strategies both in situ and ex situ conservation measures we have seen right i hope you have gained uh, some good knowledge about the biodiversity topic and hope this will help in performing better in the examination next we will see uh, some questions that are all that are being asked from this topic previously the so question one question it is asked in 2012 the question is which of the following can be threats to biodiversity of a geographical area so options are global warming fragmentation of habitat invasion of alien species promotion of vegetarianism so here you can understand that the first three are threats to biodiversity actually promotion of vegetarianism it helps conservation of biodiversity we can say it helps in preservation of biodiversity so option is all 1 2 3 and 3 are correct 1 2 and 3 are correct so option a is the correct uh, correct option uh, next question it is asked in 2011 <coughs> so question is three of the following criteria have been contribu- contributed to the recognition of western ghats sri lanka and indo burma regions as hotspots of biodiversity right so six options are given so from the uh, six uh, we can say strategies are given uh, so among them six are uh, 
six criteria are given. So among them, three criteria of uh, have elk in demarcating demarcating the Western Ghats and uh, the Indo Burma region as the hot parts of biodiversity. So the six categories are species richness, vegetation density, endemism, ethnobotanical importance, threat perception, adaptation of flora and fauna to warm and human conditions. So among them, the criteria that has helped the I mean for declaring the Indo Burma region, <coughs> sorry, Indo Burma region and the Western Ghats, Sri Lanka region as a biodiversity hotspots are one is the sea's richness vegetation and density it is not contributed endemism it is contributed we have understood that this region western Ghats region and uh, the eastern himalaya region they are known for species endemism ethnobotanical importance it is there but it is not contributed to the classification threat of perception so this is right so threat perception they are the, the both these regions they are facing a lot of threats when it comes to biodiversity. So this also contributed to the classification. Right. So the correct option is 1, 3 and 5. Correct option is option C. Right. So this is all for today. Thank you. Thank you for joining the lecture. And uh, see you next time. So until then, have a good day. Tomorrow, we will start with science and technology topic. Right. Have a good day. Uh, see you next time. Bye.